So, Dr. Mason, welcome. Please, Diana. Okay, Diana, welcome. It's just super great to have you here to be our distinguished lecturer. Uh, actually, this is an endowed lectureship of Dr. Carolyn Williams, the Antonines Williams. Who is one of my heroes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Good, good, yeah. good, 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 good. Yeah. So we're going to just do a little round table of different questions, just learning a little bit more about you. So I'm going to start off with a, a really hard one, and that is, when did you first know you wanted to be a nurse? If you'll share that story, what that was like. Well, it was when I was having my tonsils out, mm -hmm. and I had a very sore throat, of course, and I want, ice cream made it feel really good. And I asked the nurse for ice cream, and more ice cream, and she said no. And I called her the bad nurse. <laughs> and then there must have been a change of shifts, and it was actually a younger nurse. I can almost see her, brown hair, and I must have been four years old. And I said, my throat hurt, and she said, well, maybe you need more ice cream. Yes, she's the good nurse. <laughs> yes. And it was that that sense that this nurse knew what I needed. And I thought, I want to be a good nurse. Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't have any ice cream to offer you today. <laughs> exactly. I think she's well, got some well, other things. I, I've kept the ice cream on the whole okay. time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so when did you know that you wanted to do policy uh, research, health policy research or, or advocacy work? Well. So I knew that I wanted to do political and advocacy work before I knew I wanted to do research about it. And, I, I, and I'm, I wasn't even sure that I wanted to do research on it. So it really was that um, I became very interested in the impact of policy on nursing and in, in health care. I had an interest in civics. In high school, I had a very good civics class, and, and I'm concerned about some of those classes going away. Mm -hmm. I had a very good class, and it raised my awareness about the world. And then I went to West Virginia University School of Nursing, and in a uh, community health nursing class, public health nursing was threaded throughout the curriculum, and we had an exercise where <clears throat> the faculty member said, brought in a newspaper, gave us each a page, and said, find something here that's related to health. And I had something, you know, it was nothing obviously health on the page. And she could find something, anything, and related to health. And one of the things I learned from her was that everything is connected to health. And so that raised my awareness about how, what affects all of these things, what affects our world, how is our world shaped, and the role of policy in that. So I had this interest in policy and things political. But I, when I moved to New York City, I had a private practice with, um, we, we tried to form a private practice, uh, two, two fellow faculty and myself from Hunter College. And we found that we could not get corporate insurance to be a corporation. And that meant we would be a partnership and legally liable for what each other did. And while we trusted each other, it's like, you know, I'd really rather have the protection and we couldn't get third-party reimbursement. So that mobilized me politically, and I got involved in the local nurses association in New York City, which was bigger than some state nurses mm -hmm. associations, <clears throat> and got on the legislative committee and became chair and then got on the board and, and was president of that association involved in the New York State Nurse Association ANA. And, and so that was really about seeing the connections between policy and the barriers that nurses face in doing the work. Uh, and it was actually sort of stunning to me, the barriers that we faced. And I, I think it was mostly because of my West Virginia experience. I had, I was, you know, struggling middle class family. It was very much a struggling family, but middle class. My father was an engineer. <coughs> and uh, it, at, West Virginia University, we went into very poor communities. And I, I didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And we had discussions about poverty, and, and, and there was a book about the Elizabethan poor laws and how those had shaped how people saw poverty. And that po poverty was seen, if you were poor, it was seen that there was a flaw in your character rather than it was the social conditions around you. And so it was, I found that very intriguing and compelling. And so when I went to do my PhD, I had the intention of doing a PhD related to poverty and the connection between poverty and health. 
And at NYU, you had to do a concept paper first. And that was your part of your candidacy and defend that. And I did a, a, my paper on the concept of poverty. And in delving into the reams and reams and reams of literature, including database literature, on poverty and health, I realized we don't need more research on this. We don't have the political will to do anything with the research we have. And I switched my research. And I had an interest in chronobiology uh, and had done some work for my master's with Marilyn Rubin at St. Louis University, who did chronobiology uh, research. <clears throat> and I switched and did work with Carol Hoskins, who was a serious researcher at NYU, one of the leading researchers there on the nursing faculty. And she was doing chronobiologic research. So I did, my dissertation was on circadian rhythms you know, on health and wellness or something, you no, know, well-being and something, temperature and well-being for older women. And I did a postdoc that also had me, it was at Rutgers, and I was working with some neurobiologists on uh, circadian rhythm research. It's a very demanding field, and it's a field that is very conflicted in terms of methodologies. And if you, I knew that if I, need, if I was going to really do serious work here and be a leader in the work, I was going to have to push everything else aside. And when I sat down and I had an article to read on chronobiology or an article that was sociopolitical stuff, I read the sociopolitical stuff first. And I thought, why am I forcing myself into this other area when my passion is clearly in this other place? And I switched. And I would not recommend that <laughs> because I was not prepared to do policy research. Um, I didn't have that background at that point. And so I don't consider myself a policy researcher. I dabble in research. Uh, I know enough just to get by. But more I'm, I'm into, my focus is really on trying to um, it's do more policy analysis. What are the issues out there? How do we want to think about them? What are the options out there? What is the research and how does that inform the policy? Uh, so, I, I, but I felt it was my passion and even though I didn't have the right experience, education around policy work, I didn't have, I wasn't steeped in that and I recommend to people now, you want to do policy work, go find a policy program. Uh, but I, it was where my heart was and so I pursued it. Yeah. Well, building on the research, what career advice would you give to aspiring researchers or academic leaders and maybe like tips for success? So for today, I think anybody who is a serious, wants to do, be serious at research and particularly do, an, do academic research needs to do the postdoc. And I would also advise them to find a PhD program where the faculty member and the program are going to help you do the pre-doc fellowship. They're going to work with mm -hmm. you and hopefully you're not doing a full dissertation, you're doing the three paper option. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so you're prepared coming out the door, yes. you know, with some publications and what have you. Um, <clears throat> so, so I say, you know, go do that postdoc. Um, I also think it is find your passion and from my, the story I just told, Try to really be true to what your passion is and figure that out. You know, I tell, I tell people, your dissertation is not your life's work. However, if you can get your grounding, if you can really spend that time, if I had instead really spent the time at NYU looking at policy and poverty and how it informed poverty and what was the research that we needed, if I had not been, been so sure that, you know, it, you just didn't need more research here. Um, I think I would have, I would have been in a different place. So I say find your passion and try to feed that passion while you're in that doctoral program. But I'm going to say something else that you're probably not going to like, <clears throat> and that is that I, I think one of the one of the things that I think not just nurse schools of nursing are doing, a lot of other schools do it too is that we're chasing the holy grail of the R01. And those funds are scarcer and scarcer. And so we we are, I know from some research that I've done with the geriatric nursing scholars 
um, that the Academy had for over 10 years. We did a, an analysis of what were those scholars doing with research and policy. They were doing very little with policy. Even those who had been doing policy had to stop it when they went to their academic positions because they were told, you only do the database research papers and you go after the grants. Whether, when you, if, if policymaker wants to talk with you, that doesn't count for anything. Mm -hmm. You do that after you get tenure and when you're a full professor. Right. Uh, and that's wrong. If we're, what does impact mean? And I would say, why are you doing this work? And don't get pigeonholed into you can't do anything else but the database research papers and go after the grant. If all you want is tenure, maybe you got to do that. But I would say tenure is not the holy grail either. Mm -hmm. and, and you shouldn't be beholden to the tenure clock. You should pay attention to it. But I really think we're doing a disservice to the potential impact of our work if we're telling students, or, or and not students, we're telling young faculty, the, you don't spend time in the legislature talking about the impact of your work on policy. Now, University of North Carolina School of Public Health now has a place for faculty going up for promotion and tenure. They have a place in their CVs for impact with policymakers mm -hmm. and any presentations they've given, any testimony, mm -hmm. uh, if they've consulted with the legislature, etc. So I think it's really, it, you, you have this passion and why. It's not to get you tenure, it's to have an impact. And impact is not just peer-reviewed journals, you know? These days, impact is doing that database article, but then making it go viral through social media, through doing radio work, television, talking to the policymakers, et cetera. So I think, one, both as a school, but as an individual, to broaden our horizons about what impact means and really, really help to move your work forward for impact. Dr. Mason, I, I think uh, Dr. Heath and I probably could share some stories of why we stay awake at night. Uh, <laughs> but we also want to know what might, as an academic leader, what keeps you awake at night? And not just my changing sleep pattern. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> um, uh, it, you know, it really, it, what keeps me awake at night is my concern about the direction that our country is going in, mm -hmm. the lack of um, support for evidence-based anything, the lack of support for science, um, science-informed policy. Uh, so, so that has me deeply concerned. And I think the other thing, and it is my passion these days, is the fact that I'm going to speak about this this afternoon, that we we have this huge acute care system that's eating up tremendous resources. And in the meantime, we have communities that are not healthy. And if we took a fraction of that money and put it into building healthier communities, we wouldn't need such a large acute care system. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really trying to spend a lot of my time on how do we help. I'm, I'm interested in helping nurses understand acute care is not the end all be all. And if you are in acute care, broaden your vision for how you think and see this person in the bed. They live in a community, and they are coming here possibly because the community is not healthy. Mm -hmm. And how do you work with that and do something with that? Um, so it's, 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 it's also realizing that we've got to do more with engaging in our communities, whether uh, in a paid position or as a volunteer. I'm in preferment. Mm -hmm. I retired from my full-time job. Mm, I like that my, my appointment <laughs> at GW is a courtesy appointment. It's not paid, so I do what I want to do. And I got advice when I was retiring from Paul Batalden, who um, was up at Dartmouth and started the, the Dartmouth Institute Summer Institute on Quality and Safety in Healthcare. We called it Summer Camp. <laughs> and it was a small group of maybe 60 people, a third physicians, a third nurses, a third healthcare administrators, mm -hmm. all of whom had something to do with educating the next generation around quality and safety in healthcare. And it was a very intensive week experience. You had to be fully present. It was an amazing, amazing learning experience, and it changed how I teach. 
<clears throat> and he is a brilliant man and lovely pediatrician and just fabulous guy. And he had stepped down and he had retired. And I went to him and I said, do you have advice for retirement? He said, I do. He said that he and another fellow were retiring at the same time and they decided to survey their colleagues and ask, what, you know, what advice do you have for us? And he said, almost to a person, they said, you must take off six months to a year and do nothing. And he said, I think it was bad advice. They were all depressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said, I think you have to find your passion, say no to everything else, and gradually scope back your time. Mm -hmm. on that. So I spent a year thinking about what is my passion. And my passion is helping nurses in particular, but also other healthcare, pro healthcare providers, and the public to understand we don't need more acute care. We need less of that acute care. We need better acute care, safer acute care. And we need to move some of those resources into building education in communities and creating better jobs, you know, addressing those social determinants of health. And so that's what my passion is and what I'm doing. And it's also what I'm doing in my upstate community. I live in New York City, but I have an upstate community that I'm really engaged in. And, uh, and my, one of my, the, my second goal was to walk the talk in my upstate community. Mm -hmm. So I'm now doing work with, uh, pr particularly on the prevention end, but I'm facilitating a coalition on preventing, uh, on addiction prevention and treatment up in eastern Delaware County, New York. And um, it's, it's what feeds my passion, yeah. So I'm really excited that you're going to talk about that this afternoon because our faculty is going under uh, undergraduate revision for our curriculum, awesome. and um, getting the focus to the, to all the specialties that it doesn't all have to happen in, in the yes. hospital. Yes. And so I think our faculty is really um, excited at this point now to kind of think about um, doing different care, not only at UK Healthcare, which has been a wonderful partner, yeah. we're blessed to have them next door, yes. but also kind of you know, really encouraging them to think about clinical small cases. So, I would ask them, what are they doing in the community? And I bet they're doing stuff already. They're doing some, yes. We're doing some, but I think a lot of the time has, I would say, 80% of one of our specialty clinics, or 90, is spent in the acute care settings. Um, for obstetrics, pediatrics. For students. For students. But what is the medical center doing with the community? That. They they do have a lot of community oh, engagement. Very but little. There is opportunities for Interesting. growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because there is this movement across the country. The AMA just came out uh, with an announcement that they're partnering the AMA with United Healthcare to look at how to build data uh, data on social determinants of health and use that data uh, with patients and use that data to essentially create healthier individuals, families, communities. So when the AMAs jumped on it, you know. And, and here's the thing, and, and I'll speak to this in, in the lecture, we have a history of that, you know. We have a legacy of, of nurses who have done that community work. And, and we got seduced into the acute care form. We were the good doers, you know. We, we went where we were needed at the time. And, and now things are shifting. And if we aren't going, if we're not moving with that shift, we are going to be left yes. behind. You know? So I think we have to pay attention to that and also seize the opportunity. Yeah. So something that might be helpful, then we'll finish up with these questions. This afternoon and throughout the day, you'll be meeting with several of our UK healthcare colleagues. And we have new leadership that's been here for uh, going on year two now. And uh, so the, the vision is different. It has always been tertiary coordinary care at, for our medical center. Um, but our new EVP of Health Affairs, who came from Duke, is very much aware that we, the University of University for Kentucky, needs to have a larger footprint. And it is more about looking at our communities and population health. So Great. times are changing. Terry. Great. Diana, so I have two questions for you. Um, first, who is your favorite mentor, either nurse or non-nurse, and why? And then, what is your favorite leadership book? Um, I'm going to start with the last part first. Okay. My favorite le leadership book is probably, I mean, Angela McBride has a great leadership mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. 
but outside of nursing, the, the one that really informed my leadership was um, Jean Baker Miller's Towards a New Psychology for Women. Mm -hmm. And it talked about women in power. And it made me realize I don't have to think about power, operate with power in a way that the traditional, excuse me, patriarchal model mm -hmm. provides. And she was, talked about power sharing versus power over. And that really helped me in terms of my own leadership style of, of understanding that I really don't need or want power over. I do want to share power. And that's comfortable for me. It spreads power. It empowers others. And it's just the way that works for me. Uh, for mentors, I, I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for a mentoring my undergraduate program. <laughs> so if there are undergraduate students watching this, yeah. um, if you have a mentor on your faculty, go for it. They can be uh, lifesavers. So I was, you know, pretty good student for a while in my undergraduate program, and um, and then I discovered bridge and a lot of other things. And um, my senior year, I almost failed out. Now I, I had a very high A average. I did not end up with that average. And I had a community health nursing course, and well. As I said, we had public health threaded throughout the curriculum, and we followed a developing family the whole time we were in school. Well, my family was going through a divorce, and it was like, oh my gosh. And I, you know, I'd call them to make the visit. You had to make a monthly visit, and you know, I'd call, let it ring a couple times. Well, they didn't answer, <laughs> and right, and um, my, I, I was, I think, about to fail the course, and a Patricia Deal was my advisor. She was an undergraduate nursing professor, a very gentle soul. She's died, unfortunately. Um, but I actually acknowledged her in the first edition of my book as really, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for her. I don't know what she did, but I passed that course. I talked to her, and she said, well, let's see what we can do about this. And she knew I, you know, I was a good student otherwise, and uh, she helped me somehow. Mm -hmm. And I always felt like she was in my corner and she, she, I owe her everything. That's yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> nice story. Yeah. Okay, I have the last question. Oh, oh no, Janie has the last one. I have the next last one. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've spoken a little bit about this, but if you were asked again to serve as president of the American Academy of Nursing or another entity that has the ability to influence health or yes. policy, what would your focus be now that you'd want to drive? It would be. Uh, moving on creating healthier communities. So the what are the policies that affect the health of communities? So when I was president of the American Academy of Nursing, I ran because I felt it wasn't living up to its policy mission. Mm -hmm. And we really worked to ramp up that work. What, what still needed ramped up and what really is, I think, happening now, which is really exciting to see, is the dissemination of the work. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have anything to disseminate, yeah. You know, you got to start with getting the policy papers out there <clears throat> and <clears throat> making sure that they're good papers. We've they've been we started we ramped up that work and they're continuing that work and now they're focusing on how do we ramp up our dissemination and that's exactly where they ought to be. I also think they are tackling some of the broader issues. They just came out with a position paper on. Um, the incarceration, was it the incarceration of pregnant women? Uh, with substance, was it with substance? I think it was substance. I, I, I'm on one for choosing why. I'm on a choosing why yes. as a white paper, yeah. which has been an interesting experience. It's the, I, I served on that in a really small capacity just uh -huh. as a member of that subset working on it. But uh, I, I love seeing that with the white papers on the new fellow because a couple of years ago. So I, I think that that's wonderful for us to see those papers. Yes. Yeah. But it's, we've got to have more than us see them. Now the Academy is signing on to, to uh, Amex briefs. Um, they are signing on to other kinds of uh, policy positions that other organizations. So we are partnering, which I think is very smart. It doesn't have to just be us. Uh, but getting nursing's voice out there on issues I think is really important. 
So I have the last question, mm -hmm. and then we'll turn the camera off and we'll ask you some really good <laughs> questions. <laughs> so if you were to pick just one um, historical figure, one uh, leader nationally, globally, to have lunch with or dinner with, who would that be? And it has to be a non-nurse, oh, living, live, non-nurse, non living or not living. Oh. Uh, who, who would that be, and and why? Because I know you could pick a bunch of nursing leaders. Oh, I thought it was going to be nursing. Who is the non-nurse? Non mm -hmm. You just want to have some time. Probably Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah. Okay. I see. I I was thinking nurse. And it was Lillian Wald. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Lillian Wald, because I mean, she got it about yeah. community. She totally got it. Yeah. Um, she was awesome. So, what stands out in your mind about Eleanor Roosevelt? Just that she, she, her vision for what was important and what mattered, mm -hmm. but also her style. That she, you know, she was uh, sort of this. Uh, almost the ugly duckling, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And she just put herself out there. And it wasn't always comfortable. Yes. But she did it. And she understood that when it was about what mattered, that you could do it. Yes. And that she had to be the voice for people who didn't have voice. Yes. And I, I think that's it. Yeah. And how did she put up with her mother-in-law living right in the same oh building? Yes. They lived. So at Hunter College, there is the Roosevelt House. And it was the Roosevelt house where um, Franklin and Eleanor lived that his mother bought. Oh, and she lived on one side, they lived on the other, and there was a connection between the two. Wow. Yes. And evidently she was quite overbearing. Okay. And so I'd love to know how she dealt with that. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm reading with a mother-in-law <laughs> or dad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so yeah. much, Diana.